Hello and welcome to our lesson of week 12. This week we're going to finish talking about the Laplace transform. One thing you may notice straight away is very few slides this week. This is because this is one of the hardest uh, weeks of material, so I'm putting very little in. Probably I will finish in less than an hour this week, even though I will be going an extra slowly this week. If you recall our lessons about the Laplace transform, which was spread over the last four weeks. The idea is we use the Laplace transform to change a difficult differential equation into a, an equation which we can solve. And then we use the inverse Laplace transform to go back to finding the solution to the differential equation. Two weeks ago, we introduced the idea of a step function, a discontinuous or piecewise continuous function. We carry on talking about the step function. We talk about differential equations in which the forcing function involves the step function. And then in the final section of this chapter, we'll talk about a technique using the convolution principle. So far, when we've been solving initial value problems, our forcing function has always been a continuous function. But that's not realistic. That's not the sort of situation you might see in engineering. A very simple idea here. Let's suppose we have a machine which we can switch on and off. Then we don't have a continuous function for the input. We have an input function which is either off, zero, and then it's switched on, one, and then it's switched off again. When the machine is switched off, we expect our input to be zero. And then if the input is zero, we expect the output to also be zero. And then let's suppose after 10 seconds, we switch our machine on. Then the input is now one. What is the output? We expect that the machine quickly speeds up and then has a constant um, output. And then let's suppose then we switch the machine off. Let's suppose after 20 seconds we switch the machine off, so the input is again zero. The output, the effect of the machine, we expect to then drop down to zero. For example, let's suppose we're looking at an initial value problem like this, where the input, the forcing function, is not a smooth function. This function is continuous, but it's not a smooth function. How can we solve a problem like this? The answer is we can use the unit step function. Our forcing function f, we can write in terms of the unit step function. The function starts at zero, so the first part of our function is zero. There's a change at five, so it's going to be something u five, and then there's another change at ten, so it's going to be something u ten. At each one of these changes, we do right minus left. At the first change, the function on the right is 1 over 5 t minus 5, and the function on the left is 0. So our change is going to be 1 over 5 t minus 5 minus 0. And similarly, at 10, the function on the right is 1, the function on the left is 1 over 5 t minus 5. So we expect our change or our jump to be 1 minus 1 over 5 t minus 5. And I can simplify this in the range. That's to 1 over 5 multiplied by u5, t minus 5 minus u10, t minus 10.
So we're going to be solving the initial value problem. Y double prime plus four Y is equal to this function. And just to make this easier, I'm putting the initial conditions as zero. Let me remind you of two formulae from previous weeks. Four weeks ago, we saw that the Laplace transfer of T is 1 over S. And two weeks ago, we saw the shift formula. The Laplace transfer of UC multiplied by F of T minus C is E to the power of minus CS, capital F of S. And this is what we have. We have a 5, U5, and T minus 5. And in the second part, we have 10 and 10. Because these numbers are the same, we can use the formula at the top. If we take the Laplace transform of this differential equation, and we put the initial conditions of 0, on the left, we have s squared plus 4 capital Y. And on the right, 1 over 5, e to the power of minus 5s minus e to the power of minus 10s divided by s squared which I'll leave for you to check. Rearrange this, divide both sides by s squared plus 4. We get 1 over 5 e to the power minus 5s minus e to the power minus 10s divided by s squared, s squared plus 4. We need to find the inverse Laplace transfer of capital. How do we do this? This looks like a complicated function, but we can break it apart into smaller steps. First of all, there's a 1 over 5 at the front. We don't need to worry about this. The inverse Laplace transform is a linear operator, so we can put the 1 over 5 in later. Just forget about that for the time being. On the top, we have exponential functions. We can also forget about these. Forget about the exponential functions, and let's just pretend that the function on the top is 1. This makes it a bit easier. First, we will find the inverse Laplace transform of this easier function, and then we'll worry about the exponential functions and the 1 over 5. More precisely, I'm going to introduce a new function called capital H. And then I can see that capital Y is 1 over 5, e to the power of minus 5s capital H, minus 1 over 5, e to the power 10s capital H. Step 1 will be to find the inverse of class transfer capital H. And then we will use that to find the inverse of class transfer capital Y. Because the Laplace transfer of uc, h of t minus c, is equal to e to the power of minus x capital h, the shift formula again, we can say that uc, h of t minus c, and there's a typo here, this s should be here, is equal to the inverse of that transform of e to the power of minus cs capital h of s and then there should be a t in brackets just here so the idea is if we can find capital h then so if we can find cap if we can find small h then we can find small y So let's find a small h first. For a function like capital H, we use partial fractions. And I'm leaving it for you to check this calculation. If we break this apart into the first degree polynomial divided by s squared plus another first degree polynomial divided by s squared plus 4. Put everything over the same denominator, 
we can find A, B, C, and D. And we can find that our capital H is the same as 1 over 4 over S squared minus 1 over 4 over S squared plus 4. We know how to find the inverse of class transport of this. Look at your table of elementary class transforms. You will see that the inverse of class transform of 1 of s squared, of course, is just t. And the inverse of class transform of 2 divided by s squared plus 4, of course, is sine 2t. So we can find that small h is t over 4 minus 1 over 8 sine 2t. These are the same ideas that we did two, um, four weeks ago. Now that we know small h, we can do the extra technique that we're learning this week. We can use small h to find small y. So, small y must be the inverse of class transform of 1 over 5 e to the power minus 5s in capital H, minus 1 over 5 e to the power minus 10s capital H. We know small h now, so now we can use the formula at the top to find small y. That's 1 over 5, u5 of t, small h of t minus 5, minus 1 over 5, gives you 10 of t, h of t minus 10. To finish this problem, we substitute in small h, and we get our answer. Here it is. It's this, the answer is this complicated thing. All I'm doing is I'm substituting in our formula for small h. Small h was t divided by 4. Divided by 5, we get a 20. But of course, it's not just it's not t now, it's t minus 5. So t minus 5 divided by 20. And then it was minus 1 over 8 sine 2t. 8 minus multiplied by 5 is 40, so minus 1 over 40 now. It's not a sine of 2t now because it's t minus 5. So instead of sine 2t, we have sine 2 multiplied by t minus 5, which is the same as 2t minus 10. And then we do the same for second term. Now we, we want to substitute in h of t minus 10. Maybe the same type of function as the first bracket, but it's, it's going to be t minus 10 instead of t minus 5. So t minus 10 here and 2t minus 10. So that's the idea of this section. Let's do another example. Solve the initial value problem y double prime, so that's 3y prime plus 2y, is equal to the function f of t, which is equal to 1, if t is between 0 and 10, or 0 if t is greater than equal to 10. We might think of this forcing function as a machine which is on for the first 10 seconds, and then the machine is switched off. We write our forcing function f in terms of the unit step function. It's just 1 minus u10. And then we take the Laplace transform of the differential equation and use the initial conditions to find that s squared plus 3s plus 2 capital Y minus s plus 3 is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus 10s divided by s. Let's rearrange this. Capital Y must be s squared plus 3s plus 1 minus e to the power minus 10s divided by s, s squared plus 3s plus 2. 
which I leave for you to check. Well, to move on to the key ideas of this week. This is a complicated function. I want to break this apart into two easier functions. First of all, I'm going to ignore the second part, the minus e to the power minus 10s, and we get a simpler function, s squared plus 3s plus 1 divided by s, s squared plus 3s plus 2. Then I want to look at the second part. We've already done s squared plus 3s plus 1, forget about this. Exponential function, I'll deal with that later. I don't want to worry about exponential function just now. So let's just pretend that this is just 1 on the top. Then we get this function, h. First, we're going to find the inverse and class transform of g and h, and then we'll use those to write down the inverse of class transform of capital Y. Because capital Y is G minus e to the power minus 10s H. If we can find small g and small h, then we can find small y. Partial fractions again, I'll leave this for you to check. Capital G, I think, is a half divided by S plus 1 over S squared plus 1 minus a half S plus 2. And capital H is a half over S minus 1 over S plus 1 plus a half S plus 1. Do please check this when you have a moment because, you know, I do make mistakes on these slides. We know how to find the inverse of class transforms of functions like these. Again, please check that small g is a half, 1 plus 2 e to the power minus t, minus e to the power minus 2t, and small h is a half, 1 minus 2 e to the power minus t, plus e to the power minus 2t. Now we're ready to write down the solution to the initial value problem. We want to find the inverse of class transform of capital G minus e to the power minus 10s capital H. The first part is easy. We have this. For the second part, we're going to need our shift formula. Our shift formula says the inverse of class transform of e to the power minus 10s capital H is u10 h of t minus 10. We're going to substitute in small g and small h and we will have our answer. Small g, we just copy straight down. For small h, we need to replace each t by t minus 10. So it's going to be 2e to the power minus t minus 10 and e to the power minus 2t minus 10. So that's the basic idea. Let's do another one. So y double prime plus 4y is equal to u, u pi minus u phi pi, with the initial conditions 0 and 0. For our forcing function, we have a function which is 0 first, and then equal to 1, and then equal to 0. So this is somewhat similar to first example I did with the machine which was switched off and then it switched on and then it switched off again. We take the Laplace transform of the differential equation and we're going to divide both sides by s squared plus 4. I 
as we always do, I don't want to find the inverse of inverse capacitor of capital Y directly. I want to look at an easier function first, and then I want to use that to find small y. I'm going to ignore all of the exponential functions first and just pretend there's a 1 on the top. I'm going to let capital H be 1 divided by S, S squared plus 4. First I will find small h, and then I will use that to find small y. Here is the calculation to find small h. I use partial fractions. And again, I leave this for you to check. To find this is a quarter, 1 over s, minus a quarter s over s squared plus 4. And then I use my table of elementary Laplace transforms to see that this is the same as a quarter Laplace transform 1 minus a quarter Laplace transform cos 2t. As soon as we know this, we can write down a small h. Small h must be a quarter minus a quarter cos 2t. And after we know small h, we can find small y. The solution to the initial value problem must be the inverse of that transform of e to the power minus pi s capital H minus the inverse of that transform of e to the power minus 3 pi s capital H. At this point, we use our shifting formula to see that this is the same as u pi h of t minus pi minus u 3 pi h of t minus 3 pi. Substitute in for h, remembering that we need to replace every t by either t minus pi or t minus 3 pi. So it's not 1 minus cos 2t, it's 1 minus cos 2t two minus 2 pi. And in this, at the end, it's not 1 minus 2 pi, it's 1 minus cos 2t two two minus 6 pi. And then we have our solution. As I said, this is one of that was one of the hardest topics in this course. So I hope you followed that. The final topic for today is the topic of the convolution integral. Let's suppose that we have two piecewise continuous functions. That's two functions where each piece is continuous. So, for example, if I have some function where I have a continuous piece, another continuous piece, continuous piece, another continuous piece, and another continuous piece, and so on. This is a piecewise continuous function. We can combine these two functions together in a way which is called a convolution. The convolution of f and g is defined to be the integral from 0 to t, f of the dummy variable tau, g of t minus the dummy variable tau, d tau. This is the Greek letter tau, but it doesn't matter. You could use any letter here that you wanted to use, a z or s or whatever it is, any letter apart from t. Let me run through some properties of convolution. We're going to be using the convolution formula quite a bit, so I'm writing this at the top. F convoluted with G is always the same as G convoluted with F. F convoluted with G plus H is always F convoluted with G plus F convoluted with H. 
doesn't matter if we have three functions, it doesn't matter which order we do them in. F convoluted with G convoluted with H is the same as F convoluted with G first and then convoluted with H. If we convolute a function with zero, we always get zero. So this is, these four properties should all make sense. They're easy to remember. For example, let's suppose I wanted to do cos convolute with one. Then using the formula at the top, that's the integral from zero to t, cos tau multiplied by one d tau. And of course, that is equal to sine t. Next, I want to calculate one convoluted with cos. And if the theorem is correct, this should be the same as cos convoluted with one. Let's calculate this. That's it. The integral from 0 to 1, 1 multiplied by cos t minus tau d tau. And when we calculate this integral, yes, again, we get sine t. So one more thing to notice in this example. Cos convoluted with 1 is not cos. 1 convoluted with cos is not cos. In general, Function convoluted by with one is not the same as the function. It's not quite the same as multiplication. Another example, let's suppose we want to do sine convoluted with sine. That's the integral from zero to t of sine tau, sine t minus tau is d tau. Calculation looks like this. I'll leave this with a check. If you want to practice your integration. We get a half sine t minus t over 2 cos t. Now, sine is a function which is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Cos is a function which is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So sine convoluted with sine is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. We should know that f convoluted with f is not always positive. As in this example, this is not the same as squaring a function, because sometimes we have a function which is positive, sometimes we have a function which is negative. Why are we studying convolution in our chapter about the Laplace transform? Because of this very important theorem. The Laplace transform f convoluted with g is capital F multiplied by capital G. This is an important formula which we can use to solve our differential equations. Because if we try to find the inverse of the fast transfer of two functions multiplied together, we could just write down the inverse of the fast transfer of the first function convoluted with the inverse of the fast transfer of the second function. For example, let's suppose that we want to find the inverse of the fast transfer of a divided by s squared, s squared plus a squared. The previous method we've been using is to use partial fractions. But now that we have our convolution theorem, we can use a different method. Because we have the product of two functions. We have 1 over s squared multiplied by a over s squared plus a squared. And we know the inverse of Laplace transform of each of these functions. We know that the Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared, and the Laplace transform of sine a t is a over s squared, that's a squared. So 
we can use our convolution theorem to write down that small h must be the inverse class transform one of s squared convoluted with the inverse class transform a of s squared plus a squared. That's t convoluted with sine a t, or the integral from zero to t of tau sine a t minus tau. Okay. And if we calculate this integral, we find that we get a t minus sine a t over a squared. I suppose we want to solve an initial value problem like this. y double prime plus 4y is equal to gt. With the initial conditions, y of 0 is equal to 3, y prime of 0 is equal to minus 1. And let's suppose we want to solve this problem without knowing g of t. Let's suppose we have to solve this for any function g of t. What we do is we can take the Laplace transform of the differential equation and then rearrange to find that capital Y is 3 multiplied by s over s squared plus 4 minus a half <coughs> 2 over s squared plus 4 plus a half 2 over s squared plus 4 capital G. We know the inverse of class transform of each one of these functions in brackets. We don't know the inverse of class transform of third term, but we can use the convolution integral to write it down in terms of small g. The inverse of class transform of s over s squared plus 4, of course, is cos 2t. The inverse of class transform of 2 over s squared plus 4 is sine 2t. And for the third bracket, we have two functions multiplied together. The inverse of class transform of this must be the inverse of class transform of the first function convoluted with the inverse of class transform of the second function. So we must get sine 2t convoluted with small g of t. And if we wanted to, we could write this in terms of the integral. For any function g of t, we've solved this initial value problem. The solution is 3 cos 2t minus a half sine t plus a half integral of from 0 to t, sine to t minus tau, t tau, t tau. Then at any time we're told the function gt, we only need to calculate this integral to get the solution to the problem. Find the inverse Laplace transform of 2 divided by s minus 1, s squared plus 4. We have two functions multiplied together. Function 2 divided by s squared plus 4 multiplied by the function 1 over s minus 1. And I'm splitting this up like this because we know the inverse class transforms of each of these two functions. We know that this is sine 2t convoluted with e to the power of t. or the integral from 0 to t, e to the power t minus tau, sine 2t tau d tau. Remember, 
f convoluted with g is the same as g convoluted with f, so it doesn't matter which function we put first, which function we put second, or which integral. We do whichever one looks easiest to us. And in this case, it's easier to put the t minus tau on the exponential and the, just the tau on the sine two t. And it's easier because we can take the e to the power of t outside of the integral. And we're calculating the integral from z, 0 to t, e to the power of minus tau, sine 2 tau, d tau. I'll leave this for you to check. You can practice your integration to check this using integration by parts. And we can calculate the solution to this problem. It's 2 over 5 e to the power of t minus 1 over 5 sine 2t minus 2 over 5 cos 2t. And then we come to the final example of today. Solve an initial value problem for y double prime plus y is equal to g of t, y of 0 is equal to 3, y prime of 0 is equal to minus 7. And again, we don't know g of t. g of t could be any piecewise continuous function. We need to find a general solution to initial value problems like this. So what we do is we take the differential equation and we take the Laplace transform of both sides. The Laplace transform of y double prime is s squared capital y minus s y zero minus y prime zero. The Laplace transform of small y is capital y, and then the Laplace transform of small g is capital g. The initial conditions are three and minus seven. We we'll put these in, and we can rearrange the left side to solve the capital Y. Minus 12S plus 28, we can move to the right side. We can divide everything by 4S squared plus 1. And we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of 12s over 4s squared plus a quarter minus 28 over 4s squared plus a quarter plus capital G over 4s squared plus a quarter. We can simplify this a little bit because we have 12 divided by 4 and we have 28 divided by 4. And then what do we have? We have an s divided by s squared plus a number. We know how to do this. And we have number divided by s squared plus number. Okay, we know how to do this. So split it up into things that we can find on our table of elementary Laplace transforms. S of s squared plus a quarter, we can find a quarter divided by s squared, so a half divided by s squared plus a quarter. Again, we can find this on our table. And the same just here. In order to make these look like the functions on the elementary, on the table of elementary Laplace transforms, we take the other numbers out. 3, 14, and a half we take outside of the brackets. And then of course we have the Laplace transform cos 2t first. A half over s squared plus a quarter is the Laplace transform sine 2t. We're almost finished. We want to write down small y. First part is easy. 
the inverse Laplace transform of 3 multiplied by the Laplace transform of cos 2t. Of course, it's just 3 cos t over 2. Likewise for the second part, this is easy. Minus 14 sine t over 2. And then we come to the third term. We're going to do the inverse of plus transform of a function multiplied by a function. Of course, we used convolution theorem to write this down as a half, small g of t, convoluted with sine t over 2. And we give the solution to our problem like this. This is the end of this week's lesson. As I said, I would be less than 60 minutes this week. Next week, we're going to start talking about systems of first order equations. We'll cover the first four chapters. It's the first four sections of the chapter. Next week, we're going to be using a fair bit of linear algebra. Before next week's lesson, please have a quick look through your linear algebra lecture notes, your mathematics 3 lecture notes, or your linear algebra textbook, and just remind yourself about matrices, linear independence, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, the one scheme, etc. We'll be using these ideas next week. Are there any questions? I, I don't know about the final exam date yet. It's, it hasn't been announced by Dean's office. <laughs> <laughs>